Okay. Yeah, she started. Okay, yeah. she just started. Yeah, she just started. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so... Okay, uh, she's beginning the streaming. Okay, uh, let's go into... To begin, uh, the thesis defense of Camila Areias de Oliveira. Uh, she's a student of the post-graduation course in geochemistry. So at the, the first day of September, 2012. Uh, 2012. What? 2020. <laughs> 2020, yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, we start the, the transmission um, uh, for the realization of the thesis defense uh, for this uh, this thesis uh, entitled uh, Hydro Hydrological Cycle and Environmental Controls on Biogeochemical Cycles and Magnesium Carbonate Precipitation in Lagoa Vermelha and Brejo do Espinho, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, at the, this committee, we have uh, myself, the, the supervisor, uh, Professor Cátia Barbosa from Universidade Federal Fluminense, uh, Ana Paula Soares Cruz, from the California State University, uh, Professor Daniel Aristegui, uh, co-supervisor also, together with Ana Paula, uh, from the University of Geneva, from Swiss, Switzerland, uh, Professor Crisogno Vasconcelos, from the Terra, Switzerland, and Judith McKenzie, uh, from Terra, Switzerland, and uh, Marcelo Correia, uh, Bernardes, and Nicolás Misailides Strix, uh, both from uh, Universidade Federal Fluminense. Marcelo is not with us because the <coughs> Virgins uh, appear in his family, uh, but uh, Nicolás is here with us. So uh, we are going to start the, the oral presentation. Camila, you have uh, around 15 minutes to, to present your thesis. Uh, and after that, we, we follow with the, the works, okay? So, okay. good morning and have a nice presentation and go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Katya. I will share my screen. And then I first ask you all to turn off your cameras and your microphones so we don't have any trouble. So, can you see? See my screen. Can you yes. all see my screen? Okay. Yes. The, okay. the presentation one with the yeah yeah okay the good one. So I will just put myself here in the corner. Okay. So to start, thank you, Katya, for the introduction, and uh, thank you all for being here for accept the par participation in this committee. The title of my thesis is Hydrological and Environmental Controls on Biogeochemical Cycles and Magnesium Carbonate Precipitation in Lagoa Vermelha and Brejo do Espinho, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. My supervisor, as Katia said, was Katia, Dr. Katia Fernandes Barbosa from UFI, Dr. Ana Paula Soares Cruz from uh, California State University, Bakersfield, Dr. Daniel Aristeg from University of Geneva, and Dr. Cruzogno Vasconcelos from ETH and from the CPRM in Brazil. <laughs> okay, first to start, I would like to outline how this presentation is going to be subdivided for you. First, I will introduce, intro, do an introduction about some ideas on how to study lakes and why to study the lakes the Dolomite mineral, and the evolution of the formation of the Rio de Janeiro coastal plate, which will deal with the modern Dolomite formation. After that, I will present the main objectives of this study, further the study area and the methods I use it. Following that, I will present the results together with the discussion that what I have found. With that, I will finish with some outlooks for future works. Well, there is some importance to study lakes. 
they are very important to uh, they are very important target areas to study because most of them were formed to after the last glacial mass no? record of high resolution the environmental the environmental change during the Holocene. So we can see they can be used by to monitor basic process such as water chemistry, luminology, response to environmental and environment, natural environmental control, and anthropogenic perturbations. Due to their close characteristic, they can amplify the response to environmental change if compared to marine records. Biomineralization of carbonate and other minerals are widely reported occurring at the water column and at the sediment from large lakes and small lakes with different physical chemical conditions. In general, sediments are delivered to the lake from the watershed from the surrounding areas. The organic matter preserves the valuable environmental information from the inside of the lake and from the surrounding, from the lake. Most re more recent lipid biomarkers have been used as a proxy, proxy to, to comprehend the vegetation change, the vegetation change, the autochthonous production, and climate change. In particular, Lagoa Vermelha and Prejudice are natural laboratories to the study of geochemical cycles involved in the carbonate bimineralization. Well, dolomite is a calcium magnesium carbonate that the structure consists of alternating layers of magnesium and calcium with carbonate ions. They show equivalent peaks here. They show equivalent peaks in the calcium and magnesium, comproving that they are dolomite. The scarcity of, dolomite, of modern dolomite environment contrast with the large abundance of this mineral in the geological record. Moreover, the apparent inability to be synthesized in laboratory under low temperature consists the sense of the dolomite problem. Recently, a microbial factor was added to the dolomite formation model, play an important role to overcome the connecting barriers to the dolomite formation under earth surface conditions. These factors, seems to have an important implication to the formation of the dolomites in the geological record, which find laminations similar to stromatolites which structures are found. Dolomite spheres observed in microbiomats in Lagoa Vermelha are analog to those found to those nanosphere dolomites found with, the, with microbial primary dolomites in the microbiolitic phases of dolomite mountains. The microbial factor introduced a biological approach to a known geological problem. The environmental conditions prevailing in modern areas where dolomite form, such as the coastal lagoons in Rio de Janeiro, have been investigated, aiming to explore the formation of the large dolomite deposits. Well, because of this, you have to first understand the formation of the Rio de Janeiro coastal plain, which started to form during the Pleistocene marine transgression. The area was invaded by the ocean, formed round and large shaped lagoons, such as the Lagoa de Araruama. After that, after that, the sea level started to decrease, promoting the progradation of the coastline and the formation of, the, of an inland sandbar isolating those lagoons from the ocean. This regression lasted until the last glacial maximum when it reached around minus, and, minus 130 meters and in around 20, 23,000 years before present. After the last glacial maximum, the sea level rose at a rate of 140 meters, at, uh, rose, sorry, rose uh, around 140 meters at a rate of 12 meters per thousand years. And it reached the highest level around 4.5 thousand meters. During this process, it eroded the external part of the Pleistocene barrier and drowned the river mouth, creating a large and unique lagoon. 
After that, the sea levels start to decrease, provoking, promoting the isolation of the coastal lagoons in two systems. The inner system, with those lagoons formed during the Pleistocene, the Pleistocene sandbar, the second lagoons formed during the, tra the Holocene transgression, and the Holocene sandbar. This one isolated the lagoons from the ocean. So the combined effect of the sea level drop, the intensification of the upwelling system near, uh, near coast, provoked, promoted the switch of the change in the carbon in the, the sediment deposition inside the lagoons, switching from organic carbon rich mud to carbonate rich mud. With that, during this work, we aim to investigate the biogeochemical cycles involved in the deposition of the dolomite rich sediment from Lagoa Vermelha and Brazil de Spring and its link to local environmental conditions. The study area, well, the study area is located at Rio de Janeiro, in the southeast of Rio de Janeiro. Brejo de Spin and Brejo de Spin and Lagoa Vermelha are two neighboring lagoons with a difference of around 15 kilometers from each other. They are shallow and hypersaline. They are positioned between two sandbars. One isolated the lagoon from the other, Lagoa de Arariama, and another one from, from the ocean. Those lagoons are one of the few places in the world where modern dolomite precipitation occurs. Here we can see the picture of Lagoa Vermelha <coughs> and this one of Brejo de Spin. One of the characteristics that differs one lagoon from the other is that Lagoa Vermelha do not, does not dry out as Brejo de Spin does. The hydrological conditions at the area is largely influenced by oceanographic and atmospheric characteristics. At the ocean, the, oh, the ocean upwelling of the South Atlantic coastal waters brings to the surface cold and nutrient-rich waters. This condition is caused because of the steep topography of the ocean floor and the change in the orientation, sorry, the change on the orientation of the coastline that switched to, to east to west. This change favors the trade winds from northeastern. These winds, they push the Brazilian current far from the coast, which this, this water mass, it carries the tropical water, which is a hot, a warm and saline water mass. The difference between the uh, South Atlantic coastal water and the tropical water can reach 10 degrees. And then the tropical water da downwelling, it's promoting the, the, the tropical water downwelling. The coastal, the coastal upwelling of the South Atlantic coastal water affects the hydrological cycle and promotes in the coast a semi-arid microclimate, which is which character, characterize high evaporation rates exceeding the precipitation rate. This condition is enhanced during the summer because during the winter, more frequent passage of south and southwestern trade winds pushes inner shelf the tropical water inhibiting the coastal planning of the South Atlantic coastal water. The upwelling events are associated with the southward position of the South Atlantic subtropical anticyclone, which is fundamental to the formation of the South Atlantic convergence zone. The South Atlantic convergence zone, this one here, is a convective system that is linked, linked to the central Amazon to the southwestern tropical Atlantic Ocean. They, they, it, this cell representing an important feature of the monsoon system in the South America. The South American monsoon system is a seasonal phenomenon of sea convective and large scale circulation. The intensity of this system will determine the seasonal hydrological cycle over the South America, in which the Austro winter will be the dry season and the austral summer will be the wet season. The austral winter is between April and August 
and the austral summer is between November and February. Here we can see the difference in the hydrological cycle measured in prejudice spin. Here in blue is the convectivity at mean sun limit, and in red, the change in the isotopic stable isotopic composition, which will be influenced by the precipitation. Here in the corner, this corner, we can see the change in precipitation as a top composition and in yellow for tending to more enriched values and in blue to more depleted values. So to study this, we subdivided this study in two steps. First, the field work, which were carried in June 2018, that we went to collect two, sam two uh, core samples, one in Brasil Spin and another one in Agro Vermelha. And also, we did a monthly bias to collect uh, water samples from June 2018 to March 2019. Uh, samples for uh, water samples were used to measure uh, the stable as a top composition of uh, delta, 18, uh, delta 18 O and delta D. And also, we collected lipid uh, suspended water, suspended particulate, uh, suspended, uh, we collected water to filter and and collect the biomarker in the suspended particulate organic matter, which will use it to measure the isotopic composition in the annual cane. Also, we measure pH, temperature, and salinity. And the, the environmental conditions were the like precipitation, air temperature, and wind direction were retrieved from the National Meteorology Institute. Well, in the laboratory, we first split the course in two halves. One half were used to grain size, grain size analysis, density, pigment, and another, and we also collect a U channel, which were used to core scanner. The another half were free, the samples were subdivided in two centimeters, and we freeze dried the samples and used it for bulk organic matter analysis, such as. CVC, uh, nitrogen as a top composition, and also book carbonate samples, XRD. And also the freeze dried samples were used to uh, this lipid extraction, and where we obtained the anal cane fraction and the anal canoic acid fraction. And then we, we obtained the, the isotope composition of specific compound. The water samples were filtered in pre-combusted filters, and we also extract the anal canes and the anal canoic acid to obtain the isotopic composition. Well, after that, I will start to present the results and the discussions obtained from this work. I'll first talk about the surface water physical chemical controls that we obtained from the water, the environmental in general. During the sampling time, the precipitation regime of the region followed the expected behavior, whereas the winter were dry, except for a storm event in June, and the summer were wet. Precipitation here indicates that the total precipitation during the respective months and accumulated is the values that we calculated between field trips. For example, if I went to the field on 14th July, I measured the, I calculated the, the precipitation between 14 July and 10 August, this uh, interval between precipitation. Evaporation exceeds precipitation and accumulated values during both seasons. And during the wet season here, it is above the average evaporation line. So according to previous studies, the during the beginning of the wet season, here in November, uh, December, and January, meteoric water is recharging the surrounding, uh, the surrounding great, the surrounding water reservoirs. The lagoons are then fed with fresh to evaporated continental waters. Following that, following the wet season, the meteoric aquifer in the dunes becomes to draw down and progress and uh, evaporation, ex because of the evaporate, because evaporation exceeds precipitation, and then the the, the recharge of the lagoons is almost is, is, ch is changed 
to seawater. And during the dry season, when the reservoirs are almost completely down, uh, dry, the main source of water is the Atlantic Ocean. Well, first I spoke about that too, so we can understand now this plot. The beginning of the wet season here is in November, and it's marked by a decrease in stabilized of values here and increase in precipitation. The highest water temperature for both lagoons were registered during the wet season from November to March. For Lagoa Vermelha, the salinity co varies with temperature with a strong correlation, where higher values are observed during the wet season, that is in turn also the highest evaporation period. In contrast, Brazil spin do not show shows little variation during the year, with two large shifts, one in October and another one in March, and a weak correlation with water temperature. During the dry season, during the dry season, the pH is very high, indicating more alkaline conditions, and it varies in opposition to water temperature, which is around minus, uh, it's around 26 degrees. The high sal saline, saline condition coupled with the dry season would favor the dolomite formation during this time of the year, which in the case of the, the bridge the spin would be October. Surface water isotopes in bread the spin, it doesn't vary too much. They are, the oxygen and the hotel are enriched all year round, corroborate the large influence of evaporation on the water, on the water cycle of the lagoons. The negative excursion in February in Brasil de Spin, this one, is related to intense precipitation in January. In comparison, Lagoa Vermelha show more enriched values during the warmest season, and the, this, this isotope shows a tendency to vary in opposite to precipitation, what is expected. Brasil de Spin in January showed more enriched values during the dry season. Yeah. Well, we found a certain correlation between the net precipitation, that means precipitation minus evaporation, and the isotopic composition of surface water from bridge to spin, which will suggest that this lagoon is in general much more influenced by the regional water cycle than Lagoa Vermelha. Lagoa Vermelha exhibits a negative and weak correlation with surface water delta Z suggest that a secondary water source might be achieving the lagoons, which might be also, which obviously might be the Dunes Reservoir. Well, in general, the delta D and, and delta 18 of precipitation tends to correlate. The global network water line in green describes the global annual average relationship between hydrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen isotopes. The orange line is the uh, local meteoric water line constructed with the rainwater as a type of composition of the Rio de Janeiro. And it shows that the composition, the stabilized atop composition of Brejo de Spin and Lagoa Vermelha tend to show more enriched evaporative waters. That's because the it, they correlate with a slope of 6.2 and 5.6. And Palizar and Freeman elaborated a local evaporation line that means that which are lower th than 8, and it corroborates the evaporative condition. And using the equations that were proposed <coughs> in Palizar and Freeman, we estimated the oxygen as a top composition of the local rainwater which is in turn more enriched than the calculated OEPC values. This estimation agrees well with the, uh, the enclosed microclimate, the enclosed semi-arid microclimate from this he region here. Well, 
Now I'd like to address some information about the sedimentology of the cores, which were extracted from simultaneous process uh, for, on the organic and inorganic composition. So the sedimentary sequence from Lagoa Vermelha and Brazil spin divided the core into four units. The, core, the cores recovered an interval from 6,300 to 6,300 6, years to the present. And the age models for both lagoons showed oscillations and sedimentation rates. Lagoa Vermelha changed at uh, the Lagoa Vermelha at units one and two are associated with the sea level change, where the low values at the beginning of the core are associated with the interval from a uh, high sea, sea level. And it follows a sharp increase that's associated with the decrease of the sea level, <clears throat> the, uh, the decrease of the sea level during the regression of phase which will reflect the progradation of the coastline. During the formation of the dolomite rich intervals on both cores, sedimentation rate decreased, which might be associated with the lowering of the lagoon levels and exposition of the sediments. We can see this behavior for the two lagoons. And the top parts of the core are formed, are deposited by Sediments from modern age, which means younger than 1950. So now I will start to describe the, the positional stage that were responsible to form the area. The positional stage one uh, was formed between 6300 and 4500, and it occurs during the high sea level. During the high sea level which drowned the coastal plain and promoted the retrogradation of the coastline, submerging the first Pleistocene sand divide and eroding this ex its external path. The sediments are black and organic rich mud with a few sand shadow layers and they are poor in carbonate. The sea level rise when it rise, it moves the river mouth further inland and the, the, they, were, they were then discharging their sediments inside this unique and continuous lagoon connected to the ocean at that time. The CN ratio values around 20 shows the contribution of land derived plants to the overall organic matter. Rainfall in general delivered tritol elements such as iron, aluminum, and titanium. Thus, the Iron calcium ratio suggests high detrital inputs to the lagoon and the low calcium over the sum of iron, titanium, and aluminum indicates a humid climate. And also the low calcium titanium ratio showed that the water column was high at that moment. The humid climate is associated with the advance of the polar masses between 7,000 and 4,500. 500 years. And also the intensification of the South, Amer South Atlantic Monsoon system due to the southward displacement of ITCG. The wet condition was also observed by Cruz and collaborators during the formation of Lagoa Salgada in the north, north part of the state of Rio de Janeiro. The bromine calcium ratio would suggest large marine influence to the organic matter during the interval before 4,000 years. The nitrogen as a topic composition close to zero agree well with the terrestrial organic matter source to the area. The delta 13C of the DI of the delta 13C of the carbonate shows the influence of marine DIC pool and high primary productivity. In summary, this interval shows a mixture of the organic, the hash derived organic matter and the trito components, along with the marine organic matter deposited during the high sea level stage. Well, the second depositional stage occurred between 4, 4500 
and 3,800 EOs. And it shows high TLC, sorry, and it shows high TLC, indicating high primary productivity and also good preservation of the sediment. The good preservation of the sediment is likely related to the, set, to the high sedimentation rate, which tends to very fast the sediment and is a reflection of the progradation of the coastline during the sea level drop. The high bromine calcium ratio shows the influence of the marine organic matter at the sediment profiles and the, the iron calcium ratio show the, the decrease in the trite inputs. The sea level drop, uh, with the sea level drop, the terrestrial sediment is found to be trapped behind the Pleistocene barrier, not reaching anymore this the lagoon's area. Uh, the CN ratio values would show for us two units, two deposition of days in this unique unit. The high values around 4,400 years would suggest land derived organic matter in comparison to the, the, to the low values around uh, 4,200 years, which shows an incentive production of autochthonous organic matter. The CN ratio coincides with the first detection of a carbonate nodule. The humid condition would, in this time was prevailing with a slight decrease of the water column, as we can see here, by the uh, calcium titanium ratio. Uh, and this stage is recognized as a typical marsh air, salt marsh area with high primary productivity mixed with organic matter source derived from the, the ocean and with some uh, detrito inputs and episodic sudary exposition. Well, following the, 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 the position of state, the following the position of state is the lacustrine deposits that were formed when the sea level reaches the current and isolated the coastal lagoons from the ocean and from the Lagoa de Raruama. The seep of water from the Lagoa de Raruama and from the ocean from, from, uh, promoted hypersaline conditions at the lagoon and provides the ions and the saturation state necessary for the dolomite formation. This condition is maintained until today because of the negative water balance that increases evaporation and decrease and shows a low precipitation rate. The blue area here in red of the spin, it was first described as a marine sediment. However, during the time of the position of this part of the sediment, it, the sea level was already uh, almost reaching the current. So it cannot be in a, a marine uh, stage. So we interpret that this is a lacustrine, a lacustrine deposit uh, formed, during, and formed during a high water column. That's why, sorry, that's why we see high organic matter composition, and this is associated with the high primary productivity. The bromine titanium ratio increased in the lacustrine phase would suggest more saline conditions. Carbonate at this phase is, tends to uh, increase up to 96% of the total sediment. And this interval shows well-preserved organic-rich laminas interbedded with carbonate-rich laminas. The calcium titanium ratio and also the calcium over the sum of titanium, aluminum, and iron would suggest the driest period with a shallow, almost uh, completely exposed surface. The TLC of the carbonate rich unit is closer to 1 in Virgil de Spine and 0 0.3 at Lagoa Vermelha, which indicates that the organic matter is being degraded during this time, during the exposition of the sediment. Now, the carbonate composition of the lacustrine phases varies among calcite, uh, aragonite, high magnesium calcite, calcium dolomite, and also dolomite. Regidus contains fully ordered dolomite 
distributed all, all over the profile. In comparison that Lagrosa Romila, the dolomite is almost center at the concretion around seven centimeters depth. Both cores present a trend towards more stoichiometric dolomite downwards, indicating either change in solution composition or by genetic alteration by microbial activity. The enriched isotopic composition of the carbonate precipitate suggests an extremely dry environment, mostly at the dolomite rich layers here, as you can see the co variation of the dolomite composition and the stable isotope of, of oxygen. The organic matter is degraded during the exposition of the sediments, and the, the released carbon is incorporated. To the formation of dolomite. Carbonate is recognized forming at the very first centimeters of the core and also within the microbial mass, as we can see by the white dots in the figure here, in, the, yeah, in this picture of the microbial mass. The sulfate reducer bacteria that are present in the microbial mass, they will act in the, in the bimerization of primary dolomite and will increase the alkalinity that will lead to the carbonate precipitation. Oh, sorry, here is the white dot. So from the, the sedimentological data, we can uh, see the, that ma two major events happened. The period between 2500 and 1000 coincides with the intense dry phase, which is associated with the intensification of the upwelling process. During this phase, probably the northeastern trade winds were intensified due to El Nino events, which generate high, uh, uh, arid conditions, which in turn will coincide with the increase in dolomite precipitation. The second event registered was around 500, and 3,800, so 580 and 3,080, whereas the major and the elemental ratios showed a slightly change, which indicates moist condition. This humid period could be, could be a local response of the little ice age, when the ice is removed southward, generating more precipitation in the South American monsoon system. Well, so to us to better understand the organic matter source to the lagoons, we also investigated the distribution of any alkenes and any alkanoic acid in suspended particulated organic matter. So we can understand the distribution of the organic matter during one year water cycle. The suspended particulated organic matter in the any alkenes varied in number of carbon from 15 to 40, with a bimodal distribution, as we can see here. The enocanoic acid, they vary the number of carbon from 12 to 35, with a unimodal distribution centered at C16 and C18. This distribution of the enocanoic and the enocanoic acid, this, it suggests a mix of organic matter to the lagoons. Well, large amounts of leaf waxes are delivered to the lagoons during the wet season, as we can see by the increase in the blue colors during the wet season by runoff or wind action. And during the dry season, most of the annual canes are from in situ production. You can see the increase in the red colors here. In contrast, the annual canoic acid does not show any uh, variation during the, the one year water cycle and also the tumor lagoon. They show more uh, short chain compounds, suggesting uh, more in situ production. In general, the long chain odd enokines and the long chain even enokanoic acids are characteristic of the terrestrial plant boxes and the short chain. Uh, characteristics of microbial algae source, microbial or algae source. Well, 
So we did a comparison between the top core sediments and the SPOM samples, which suggests us that the N-alkanoic acids mostly represent the in situ production by the microorganisms inhabiting the microbial matrix. And the N-alkanes would suggest that they represent most of the vegetation that are surrounding the lagoons. Sedimentary N-alkanes varied in number along the profile and also in concentration. The concentration of the long chain N-alkanes is very high at the sediment rich intervals, suggesting that the sediment was probably exposed. Few intervals shows the presence of situan one. This one might be related to the Athena salina grazing, that's a zooplankton, typical of those environment, this environment, this environment, those environments. Uh, sorry. The presence of the short chain C27 distributed along the profile supports that the microbial activity in the sediment and it's corroborated by its large abundance at the top. In comparison, the alkanoic acids show different distribution between Lagoa Vermelha and Brede do Espinho. Lagoa Vermelha shows a bimodal distribution and Brede do Espinho is a, a unimodal distribution which suggests that Lagoa Vermelha has a, a double source, a mixed source of organic matter, and that this thing is mostly represented by terrestrial organic matter source. That's because red this thing is shallow, shallower than Lagoa Vermelha, and the exposition of the sediment may promote the degradation of organic matter and short chain compounds are more susceptible to degradation than the longer chain ones, resulting in an enrichment of the later with the ongoing degradation. The CPI values that are the carbon preference index for the alkenes and also the alkanoic acids corroborates the mixed source of organic matter to the lagoons. Now, the analysis of the lagoon's water are important to, to access the effect of seasonal variation in the water as a topic composition. The delta D of the long chain in Alcanes did not show great variations between lagoons. <clears throat> the, weak correlation, the weak correlation between the delta D of surface water and the delta D of C29 of the SPOM samples suggest the lagoon, the, that the water of the lagoon is not exerting the major control on the lipids as a topic composition, corroborating its alloctonous origin. The change in the longer chain as a topic composition is closely related to precipitation and uh, the increase in air temperature during the summer. The high temperature and the intensive operation would promote the enrichment of the terrain as a topic composition of the alkanes, even during the wet season, which is also the highest temperature. In contrast, during the dry season, the enrichment of the terrain as a topic composition is likely due to the lack of precipitation. So the delta D of surface water correlates with delta D of precipitation, supporting that precipitation alone is not the major factor controlling the hydrogen as a topic composition of the long chain in okay. Other processes such as evaporation, leaf transpiration, vegetation, and vegetation around the lagoon may play an important role. The regional coastal upwelling might also affect the deltaic enrichment of precipitation because this condition tends to decrease the precipitation rate at the area. And for us, it was surprising that we found a stronger than previous good correlation between the delta D of surface water and the delta D of the compound C33. This compound, this is largely found 
in grasses and herbs. And this correlation implies that either the plants are producing the, the, the plants that produce the citrus tree are derived their source water from the lagoons or from a similar enriched reservoir nearby. Or we can uh, think about the second hypothesis that is an intralagoonal production of the long chain amino acids. However, this is this will be need, this will need further investigation. And the ongoing uh, analysis of the carbon isotopes in annual canes will improve our interpretation about the change in vegetation types in the biosynthetic pathways because these conditions can affect the hydrogen isotopic composition of the annual canes. Well, since we found good correlations between the delta D of precipitation and the delta D of the C29, it allowed us to carefully use this isotopic composition as a qualitative proxy for hydrological change in the sedimentary record. Well, we found lower delta D values, light delta D values, uh, in Lagoa Vermelha, in the bottom of the core of Lagoa Vermelha, during the high sea level stage, which correlates with the humid episode record by the major elemental data. The deuterium isotopic composition of the long chain suggests arid conditions around 2300, between 15 and 1200, and around 300 years before present. Those arid episodes coincide with the increase, the decrease of, ten, of sea surface temperature and the intensification of the upwelling after 2200 2, years. The upwelling will lead with this decrease in sea surface temperature, as we can see here by the uh, planktonic foraminifera magnesium calcium ratio and also by the alkanon. Um, a previous work has described that the dolomite is forming on the surface of the sediment during the dry phase, which exposes the sediment. And after that, we can see a slightly decrease in the delta D values between 900 and 500 years. This suggests that the climate became more humid until around 300 when a large positive shift was found in Lagoa Vermelha sediment. And the delta D, the, the, the delta D isotopic composition, and also the oxygen isotopic composition, the oxygen isotopic composition, they co varies after 2200 years. My cement and collaborators did not observe any vegetation change, which suggests that the deuterium isotopic composition might only be related to the rainwater source, which in the case of the long chain okay, is the rainwater. Well, the difference between the delta D of precipitation and the delta D of lipid is expressed using the apparent fractionation value. This factor incorporates the effect of soil evaporation, transpiration, and biosynthesis. Here we see large apparent fractionation values for Brejo de Spinho in comparison to Lagoa Vermelha. That's because seasonality effects tend to affect more Brejo de Spinho than Lagoa Vermelha because this one, the Brejo de Spinho, tends to dry out. Since we found good correlations between the delta D of C29 and the delta D of precipitation, those values were used to calibrate our uses, our uses of C29, the delta D of C29 of sediment as a said as um, to reconstruct the isotopic composition of rainwater, local rainwater. And intense hydrological variability are reported between 6500 and 2400. And the last 2400 here marked in this square um, is marked by an enrichment of the reconstructed precipitation values. This is closer 
to the rain, the rainwater as a top composition of mother that is minus 28. And the relatively stable value coincides with the establishment of the current upwelling system, where the intensification of the North Basin trade winds is one of the major factors affecting the South Atlantic coast water upwelling. The deuterium enrichment marks the drier phases that co occur with the increase in salinity, which we saw in the segment core, and also in the calcium magnesium carbonate precipitate. The upwelling occurrence has a tiny connection with El Nino episodes, which blocks the frontal system from southwest, south, and also from southeast. From 1100 to 1800, more depleted values would suggest that wet conditions have started and followed by it the return of arid conditions after around 300 years. The precipitation delta D change co varies with the delta HNO of oxygen isotopes, as we see here in green, which corroborates the hydrological effects on the dolomite formation in the hypersaline coastal lagoons. Well, <laughs> After all this explanation, I'd like to point some concluding remarks that we were able first to demonstrate the link between the hydrological cycle and environmental effects that will trigger the bimineralization of dolomite in the hypersaline coastal lagoons. The stable isotopes in the surface water samples characterize the two hydrological season at the region, the wet one and the dry one. The deuterium enriched values were recorded during the dry season and the most depleted one during the rainy episode of the wet season. During the summer, when air temperature is above 30 degrees, evaporation exceeds precipitation, leading to the increase in salinity. The continuous seed of seawater during the dry season would supply the lagoons with the sulfate ions, which will be used by the sulfate reducer bacteria during the dolomite precipitation. The short chain compound in the record an increase in in situ production during the dry season. In contrast, the long chain compound would mark uh, an input of the hash compounds to the lagoons during the wet season. That is because of the combined action of precipitation and trade winds. The weak correlation between delta D of the long chain in alkene and the delta D of surface water corroborates the long term origin of the terrestrial of the long chain compounds. Well, I will talk about now the conclusion about the sedimentological analysis. It improved our knowledge about the history of the sediment deposition and the coastal lagoons formation. And we found two depositional stage. We recognize the two depositional stage. The first stage that was deposited during the Olocene transgression, when the coastal area was flooded and the river mouths were further in plain. Then the large amounts, the greater amount of terrestrial, the, the terrestrial debris was deposited in a large and round-shaped lagoon. The deuterium is a topic composition of the NLKs, along with the elemental data, indicate very humid conditions, which agree well with the weakening of the South Atlantic coastal water and the southward displacement of ITCV, which enhances the South American monsoon system. During the sea level decrease after 4,500 years, the coastal upwell was restricted to the subsurface waters, and then the climate was still humid. At that point, the Olocene sandbar was forming at the area, and the area was a typical salt marsh. The second stage is the lacustrine phases, and during that, the South Atlantic coastal upwell was established at its current position, yielding to a semi arid microclimate. <laughs> Climate. <laughs> With this, the hydrological balance is currently negative, leading to hypersaline conditions at the lagoons 
and the increase of the saturation states of carbonate leading to precipitation. The straightening of the up valley co correlates with El Nino event during the last 2200 years, showing a connection among ocean circulation, atmospheric conditions, and also the biomineralization of dolomites at the coastal lagoons. Well, I'd like to point some outlooks for future works that the ongoing analysis on the Delta 13C of specific compounds NLK and NLK acids will definitely improve our knowledge, our understanding of change in vegetation, allowing us to better understand, to do a better interpretation of the hydrological cycle. Not as yet analyzed, the Delta D of the short chain NLK could, acid, could be useful to better interpret the variations in salinity and also in stable agrotopic composition of the lagoon's water. And the improving our, of our understanding of modern and environmental conditions associated with primary dolomite formation is essential for interpreting the observed change in the geological record. Well, with this, I'd like to acknowledge my financial support, the Brazilian agency, and also the Swiss government scholarship and my collaborators, the students, Daniel, Nayara, and Luis, and also the professors, Katia, Ana Paula, Dr. Prisola Vasconcelos, Dr. Daniel, and Judy McKenzie, Dr. Judy McKenzie. And last but not least, I'd like to thank my friend and my family for the support with this. I end. Hi, Camila. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Finish so uh, you spend almost an hour. <laughs> no, fifty-four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and it was long. It's good or bad? <laughs> you tell me. Okay, so uh, how can I see you again? Should I keep uh, sharing my screen or should I stop it? Oh. That's okay. Like uh, That's okay. I don't know where are you. I I think it depends yeah. on whether people want to ask questions about the various slides using referring to various slides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, yeah, she can let I the can, presentation. I can keep it here. No problem. Yeah. I can, I can keep it here. Can keep it. I just want to know which screen you are seeing. You are seeing. I can see you, Katya. No, I can see you. Let me see. What's the problem? Yeah. I cannot see you. You cannot see me or. No, I cannot see. I'm just seeing. Uh, you can. Uh, I just see the presentation. Uh, yeah, the presentation. I'm just seeing the presentation. Try to command uh, control out to change your. Yeah, I I just <laughs> did ask. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So let's start the. The questions for Camila. Let me start with uh, uh, ladies first. So I will ask uh, Judithi to, oh. to do your questions for Camila. Camila, uh, I, I thought you talk a little uh, lower. So sometimes it was very difficult to really? understand what you're talking about. So I just ask you to speak a little bit louder. Okay, okay. Are you listening now? It's okay? Okay. 
Okay, can the you, word to Zuditi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, you hear me. <laughs> I don't see Daniel, but I guess he's he's here. Daniel? You can enlarge your There's an arrow in the yeah. Yeah. There's an arrow in the top right side or top. left. I, I there's think it's in the bottom side. Ah. Okay. Just top there you see Daniel. He's there, he's not sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't play. Yeah, it's really funny. Okay, okay. I'm hiding my <laughs> speakers now. I have one. Uh, now I have, I have, okay, but I still don't have Daniel. Daniel, are you there? Yes, I am. And I see you, don't worry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Look, congratulations. It's a very nice work. And I have to say, my first visit to Lago Vermeja Braja de Spina was in 1992 with Chris Algano when he was doing his thesis. So I'm looking about at about 30 years of research in one area and I'm always surprised that how much more we can learn. And you know, you're, I would think that maybe there's an end, but there, yours is a major chapter in this thesis. On you know, not that no on this whole project is essentially is you've mm -hmm. added a new chapter, and I think you're going to have a lot of work to be able to put this into a publication because there's so much information. Yeah. In, yeah. In your <laughs> you to so many different things, and one mm -hmm. of the things I find really impressive is the um, that it, and Chris Ogner maybe you would agree with me on this is the addition of high resolution carbon fourteen dating. Because before we knew we had these different phases, but we didn't know the time. How long did this take? When did it happen? And so now we can start seeing that um, uh, the marine phases, how it's related to sea level, for example, mm -hmm. and, and global climate in a way. And then mm -hmm. how we see the link between when we have the dolomite formation and we have this mixed carbonate formation. And, and one mm -hmm. of the things I think we're very, very lucky is, is right now today, we have dolomite forming at the surface in Braja de Spina. So we mm -hmm. have a link now, we can study this truly modern dolomite that's forming today and link it to the, the early one. And I've already mm -hmm. talked to you about this, but maybe uh, you can give me something. What are the implications of the sedimentation rate? You know, in a way, the dolomite takes an eternity. <laughs> the sedimentation rate for the dolomite is so low. And then in between, we have these packages of mixed carbonates that seem to be have very high sedimentation rates. Mm -hmm. Are there implications to this for the geologic well, think, Yeah, I think uh, we, can, we can try to transport this to the geological record. And maybe what we thought that was forming in a tiny part of the time, we can now uh, say that actually dolomite or the carbonate concretion or the carbonate rich intervals, it needs much longer time to be formed than it was expected before. Yeah, yeah. But if we look at the logic, if we look at the geological record, like one of your earlier slides was of the Dolomia, Dolomia Principale or the Haub Dolomite, mm -hmm. as we call it here in Switzerland, um, we have layers of dolomite and then we have interbedded with layers of limestone. And it, are there implications then for the timing? And you know, this package is about a hundred meters thick. Mm -hmm. Can we take your um, your dating, uh, kind of like extrapolate your high resolution dating, maybe put that into the rock record? You, do you think that's possible? <laughs> you know, yeah, I would think that it's possible in, in this sense. In, in this sense, that we can we cannot look at the the fine laminations or the fine intervals anymore, as it was only a. a, a an event of subaerial exposition. We yeah. need to understand, to, to think that this is, might take much longer time, like a, a large uh, climatic event that uh, ends up with this formation. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I, I, I think it, that one of the implications of what you've shown in your thesis with this, with this high resolution dating is that a small bed of dolomite maybe takes much more time to form than yeah. A meter bed yeah. of limestone. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Maybe put the, the, the chronological can information, Camila. Put the slide, please. I lost it. <laughs> can you see? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll just do like this. Um, yeah. It's, it's very it's very nice. It's very, very nice. Yeah, yeah so here <laughs> in this hmm? because, in this part so when I first read that, when I first read your thesis, I thought this is not possible. <laughs> it doesn't make <laughs> sense to me. <laughs> Why do we have the sedimentation rate in the car if when we have the, the mixed carbonates and then the dolomite is so slowly forming yeah. over a yeah. long time? Maybe not. yeah, maybe that's what we are seeing here in Bradley Spin wow. because we know that this part is a, is mixed of dolomite and uh, high magnesium how high magnesium car carbonate. Yeah. So maybe it's this difference here we have for the high calcium magnesium carbonate. Uh, higher sedimentation rate that is accumulating and then the dolomite is much lower that needs because we are talking about here in stoichi stoichiometric dolomite so maybe yeah. it takes longer to 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 equilibrate the peaks and to be uh, yeah. well defined yeah and what also what what i would think in a sense too is you know from the time of deposition, as the rock, the whole formation goes through diagenesis, burial, and all the rest. I mean, the dolomite, it's all dolomite, but it, this other mm -hmm. in, intermediate, you have high sedimentation rate, which gives you then um, the, a prepackage of carbonate sediments that can be dolomitized or become mm -hmm. dolomite with time because you have the magnesium there, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. and also, um, can you explain why there's, why do you feel there's a high sedimentation rate in the marine? Why does it, I didn't quite understand that. Why does it become, why is there increasing as the... This increasing here? Yeah, yeah that's, that's a nice yeah. steady increase. Yeah, for what, I, what I can understand from this increase that it correlates with the time of the sea level regression. So the, move, the, the progradation of the coastline would deposit the sediments inside this area. So it, uh, and it would be very fast. So the decreasing of the sea level would be carrying the sediments and bringing it to this area in a very fast time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's why for me, it, it shows this uh, increase in sedimentation rate. And it's very linked to the, here uh, we can see in this plot here, it's exactly the unit that we have, we show the marine to the south marsh phase. That is the, 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 mo the moment of the progradation of the coastline, the sea level decrease. So again, your high resolution dating shows a very, very nice transition. Yeah. Now, okay, just down here, uh, let's talk about uh, in the corner, there's a picture of the South Atlantic cold water this upwelling water. Okay. Now you had mentioned, uh, yeah. yeah, it's cold water, but we also know upwelling water is high in nutrients and by nutrients, yes. phosphate, nitrate, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. How do you think that, that water, do you think having intensification of the upwelling then brings more nutrients into the lagoons? If, if that seawater is then seeping into the lagoons, are we yeah. actually, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that it's definitely possible because the, the the start of the dolomite precipitation it's not only correlate with the weather the, the change in the weather caused by the straightening of the upwelling, but also the the, the approaching of the upwelling to the coast. So this and the, it's it's nice it's it's funny and I don't know if it's funny it's it's nice to to see that this upwelling is a uh, it's close to the surface. So this, this cold water, cold and nutrient rich water, it's very, very close to the coast. So it can feed to the lagoons by the sandbars. So it's yeah. of, my concept is of course, we can uh, take these nutrients to the lagoons. By okay. then, then I would extrapolate a little bit too, because we know that the, the 
the previous dolomite body is uh, based on, on the comparison we saw between the, the paleoceanography and the, um, uh, the intensification shown by uh, Gabby in her thesis. That mm -hmm. intensification of, this, uh, of the upwelling occurs at the time of the dolomite formation. And we also know there's an intensification currently going on. So do you think then perhaps there's a link then between the upwelling, the amount of nutrients getting into the lagoon and the pre precipitation of the dolomite? Could there yeah, be a link? Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Uh, the, the microorganisms, they need the sulfates and other ions to precipitate. So these can come with the, the, the water from the, from the, the ocean, by the, the, the sandbar. So definitely it can, uh, the, I think the effect does not change only the weather by the change in the evaporation rate and precipitation. It will also bring these nutrients and seep to the lagoons by the sandbar and also uh, and then uh, favor the precipitation and these nutrients will be used by the microorganisms uh, to do the photosynthesis and also to the sulfate reduction reactions and all the other reactions that need nutrients <laughs> and need organic matter yeah. So it's not a coincidence that we have an intensification of the upwelling and we see the precipitate. And it's also linked to climate. So it's very, yeah. make, it makes it be even more arid. arid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a connection. The uh, ocean, it's the atmospheric conditions and the biogeochemical cycle. Yeah, yeah it's it be beautifully trees. illustrated. <laughs> it's a nice <laughs> Austrian model that we can play with, uh, for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Everybody talks about climate change now, and you, you've shown definitely with your whole stratigraphy, particularly for Lago Vermeia, how climate has impacted this coastal environment. What would you predict is going to happen now? <laughs> how, would, how do you see? I mean, climate is changing, it's getting warmer, yeah. we have upwelling. How do you see? Yeah. The, could you predict into the future what you, if you were to go and take a core in Logo Vermeia in a thousand years, what would you see? What, what do you think? Well, okay. Well, based on this kind of data and also in the, in the Delta D of the NL Kings, I would say that uh, we are going to a warm condition, but it depends. Uh, how warm we are going, we are, we will face. If we will face uh, warm and dry conditions, that's what we see during the summer in the lagoons. We will probably deal with a lot of dolomites in this future core. <laughs> but <Yeah>. if, <laughs> if we see, if we face uh, warm and humid conditions, we probably will, won't see a lot of dolomites. We probably see other carbonates or not even carbonates. We will probably see more, more terrestrial compounds and maybe the classics that will not allow the, 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 the carbonate precipitation. I think uh, we, uh, that maybe this we can see in our future core. Yeah. Uh, well, sea level is rising, what, millimeters per year right now? I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not quite sure. Depends on where you are. But yeah. how high would sea level have to rise before the lagoon would be flooded with seawater again? Do you, I don't uh, not so much. I think uh, I have done uh, a work on my master's, and we saw that around 1.5 meters can be enough to, to the water reach the lagoons to be floated. Yeah, yeah. So and then the connection it. with our, let me say it, Arawama. <laughs> Is there <laughs> <laughs> water rising in Arawama coming over the, the, the Pleistocene lagoons or Pleistocene dunes? Would that be possible? Uh, um, probably, of, yeah, yeah. Because there is a connection with Arawama Lagoon and the ocean. And yeah. if, yeah. Very of course, if, yeah. yeah, but of course, if this connection is, um, if the, the seawater is rising, 
And of course, it will floated this connection and the Lagoja that Roma will also be floated and they can connect again in yeah. the future, in the future. Yeah. Uh, if you were going into a small business right now, would you go into artisana, artisan, artisanale or artisan salt making? <laughs> You see a future there. <laughs> it depends because now artisanal stuffs are getting uh, a good business. <laughs> so maybe I can start to sell microbial dolomite, microbial salt here in Brazil. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. I think uh, I think that's uh, leave it to some other people because I know the other committee members uh, have many questions and I thank you again for a very very nice uh, presentation and a wonderful thesis. We'll be talking. Oh, we will be talking yeah, more. Thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs> that's like you have you very much for the observations and and for sure this is very amazing to think about this uh, sedimentological rates and tra transfer this for Triassic uh, yeah. packages, uh, you perhaps uh, uh, let us to interpret the, the time, uh, the time involved in the, the deposition of the, the Dolomites uh, in the Alpes or something like that, more time than perhaps we expected. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and to see how, the time, the rates change. I think that I think that is for me fascinating. That uh, one is very slow and the other one is very fast. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Do yeah, I have, this... do I turn off my microphone now or? Uh, okay. You can't. Like you don't need. Yeah, you can. You can. Okay. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, Judy. One more time, and uh, I will pass the. The, the questions now, the, the words for uh, Danielle. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, you said a lead uh, first. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but... <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, let, let Danielle and then the best for Ana Paula. <laughs> Okay, um, well, uh, Camila, thanks very much for the presentation. I, I think that reflects very much the amazing amount of work that you have done. I mean, uh, at least I remember the year that you were in Geneva, you have produced an incredible, I mean, in between Geneva and Zurich, an incredible amount of work. And I, I really uh, would like to congratulate you for that. Um, it was very interesting to read uh, your thesis and of course when you have um, um, such a large number of very different kind of results, as Judy says, it's going to be difficult to put it in a paper, so it's gonna, it will be that you focus very much on, on certain questions, but I'm sure you will be able to do it. So um, I would, um, before going I'm very much interested in your data from the uh, that you measure uh, with the um, um, XRF and the micro mm -hmm. XRF. But before going into that, I, I just have a while I was listening to Judy's question about the the um, dating, reporting dating. Mm -hmm. You um, in the particularly in the limits of the um, Dolomite section, what did you measure? Uh, what did you date? What kind of uh, okay in the this interval I measured uh, in Lagoa Vermelha we found a lot of uh, ostracods yeah. all over the core but uh, yeah. around 90 centimeters we didn't find so much that was the the dolomite interval so I as far as I remember mm -hmm. we, I we measured um, organics. Because mm -hmm. okay. during this interval, we cannot find the ostracods because mm -hmm. there is an extreme environment, so they don't leave. <laughs> because if um, the reason why I'm asking you this is because, as you know, in C14 dating, the hard water effect is very important to produce sometimes 
uh, to deliver older ages due to the, the carbon pool is becoming, um, um, it has carbon that is older than, than mm, mm, the material that you are measuring. And that's the reason why, have you considered that in different sections of your of your date, C14 dates, you might have a more important hard water effect that would give you older dates than the real ones? Uh, I, I thought about this. I thought to consider if when I say hard, uh, hard water, you're also, oh, you are talking about the reservoir effect, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I, I I thought about this. I thought about to use two different uh, mm -hmm. reservoir effects, mm -hmm. but I think uh, as the, the marine is influencing more, mm -hmm. and we also have the seepage of water, I decided to only use the the marine reservoir right. effect for yeah. the South America. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now that that is um, because it's, it can be an important point to to explain mm -hmm. some somehow that you might have uh, sort of very old dates that are the result of this effect uh, more than more than uh, just a low sedimentation rate. But yeah, I agree with you that uh, having this the, the, is is probably more uh, reasonable to use the the calibration, the ocean calibration curve mm -hmm. for this kind of date. Okay, so. <clears throat> I think that one one thing that I like very much also in your, although I never directly work in Lagoa Vermelha, for instance, I've been several times with Chris, and then I I've been I have heard many many times <laughs> many <laughs> histories, <laughs> right, and pictures. Da, 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 da. But I what I like very much in your work is that you have put together many different data sets, and you can see well. First of all, a sort of a starting high resolution dating, but also you can see nicely the different units and the, the sedimentology mm -hmm. that you yeah. have um, analyzed and look at, at, at it quite in detail. Um, I was wondering um, something that we discussed once when you were still in Geneva and, and that you wrote in your thesis is that you showed that in when you look at the elemental um, results of uh, by XRF uh, you see that um, in Lagoa Vermelha strontium and calcium they vary uh, similarly. That is what you usually see because uh, there is usually a replacement of calcium by strontium and it's quite common to see a very um, a, a good correlation. But this is um, not the case in Brescia de Spino. And I was wondering what do you, I mean, they, they have actually an opposite um, uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what, would you elaborate on that? What do you think that it could be the reason why you have this difference mm -hmm. in between both systems? I, I, I think I, I didn't uh, thought too much about this difference about between Brazil, Spain, Lago, Venezuela, and the Strontium. But um, from now, from your question, I, I, I can't think that maybe the water, the because I think and as far as I know, the strontium it comes from the seawater, right? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, as the Brejo de Spinho is uh, a little bit higher than Lagoa Vermelha, I think the water is not sitting as the same intensive as it is sitting to Lagoa Vermelha, and maybe that's why we don't have the uh, the same kind of correlation. I'm not sure. I think uh, I have to think more about this Johnson. And yeah, Johnson yeah. is still uh, 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 a question. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, but you, it makes sense that it could be something dealing with the um, hydrolo the difference in the hydrology and the amount of water that they are getting from the uh, both systems. Huh? That they, mm -hmm. as you say, Lagoa Vermelha, it would be more uh, water coming from the ocean. Yeah, 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 and that's something that we can see at the, the surface water results. 
we can see that the Brejo de Espinho is much mm -hmm. more precip uh, influenced mm -hmm. by the rainwater than Lagoa Vermelha mm -hmm. that had both sorts of water influencing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then if we keep into the sedimentological part of the problem, mm -hmm. uh, the fact that um, Lago, you mentioned in your talk and also in several parts of your thesis that um, uh, Brejo dos Pinos can be dry, can dry out quite often, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. one of the problems that you get with these kind of um, acoustic systems is that when you have um, this drying out, you have, uh, you might lose sediment, right? Mm -hmm. So you might get, um, you might get uh, erosion by, for instance, wind erosion or something mm -hmm. like that. Did you notice something like that in the sedimentology of your, in the core? I mean, just looking at the sediments. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can think that maybe the microbial mats would, would prevent the erosion. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the fact that you have um, a higher sedimentation, sedimentation rate in, in Lagoa Vermelha, then it, that shows that they, they were not uh, hiatus in, in the sequence. But I was wondering whether you could identify any kind of hiatus in your uh, Brescia dos Pino uh, core. But you didn't see anything. No, the, I, I no. thought that you need particular. Actually, I, actually, I think actually, I never, I never look it for hiatus. I uh, never uh, take the look for this. But yeah. uh, since all the units are correlating very well, yeah. and uh, the last units we can we cannot see any dramatic change. Mm -hmm. So I think we can, there is no hiatus. It's much yeah. more homogeneous the position. But I like the idea that eventually the uh, the uh, microbial might, might, pro might protect from from mm -hmm. this because usually in this kind of system, as soon as you dry out and you have the wind from the coast, etc., you might. Yeah, yeah. Stop being, but um, you do have yeah. more silica. You have silica in Brazil, just in your in your. Remember, we talked about. Uh -huh. Yeah, the the yeah, so we the, have more silica the profile in Brazil, just in your, and we decided, and because you don't have silica in Lago Vermeja, because it's always wet, and so the silica dissolves, or the quartz, it's quartz. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So there is a difference. And you, mm -hmm. we interpreted that at the time that we discussed it, that it was probably coming from wind blown. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Maybe okay. So then another thing that is um, interesting in that data set is that you, you got um, quite a lot of um, bromium. You said that this is indicative of the salinity, right? Uh, bromine? Yeah. Uh, bromine, bromine would be bromine, yes. marine influence. So that's why I use it to, to yeah, correlate okay. it. Something. Well, but is, is, is so then um, can you use that also to see more the, for instance, if we go to the original problem of the strontium and the calcium, would that fit with the, that idea of that you would have more marine input in Lagoa Vermelha than in, in, in the other lake? Uh, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. I, I, I guess because in Lagoa Vermelha we can see an increase of yeah. bromine during the during the deposition. The deposition, yeah. Okay, so you see that I think that that's the beauty of this record now that you can compare all these and, and perhaps it's something that you might think for your paper the, when you yeah. start writing the paper to look at things like that that can show that using at these different proxies you can um, uh, you can identify what is the cause behind. The changes, right? Okay. Um, um, I would have um, maybe. Can I have another question or? Of uh, course. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Um, oh. I was thinking on your on your um, um, organic data, the organic mm -hmm. extraction that you did, and um, particularly 
the um, the but the um, assets um, that you identified in in your last um, in the last slide, you say that perhaps uh, uh, it would be possible to look more in in detail. Um, what are the um, meaning of this uh, of this uh, indicator, right? Of this proxy, but um, quite often people think that when when you have a rework of the um, uh, by microbial rework of some of the of the organic matter, you can change quite a lot the distribution of these acids. Mm -hmm. Or do you have any comment about that in com in, in relation to both records? How do you? Sorry, the, the end of the session didn't listen. Can you, can you repeat the end of the question? Yeah, the end of the question is that um, I was wondering whether, I mean, you, you know that people claim that sometimes microbial activity can rework this organic matter, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. I was wondering uh, with your um, acid data, uh, whether you, you see something uh, clearly like that in your, for instance, in your uh, dolomite rich sections in in both records, or if there is any difference. Yeah, yeah, I think that yeah. Uh, maybe yeah, yeah, in the dolomite records, uh, mm -hmm. you would if there were uh, a lot of degradation of the fatty acids, mm -hmm. we wouldn't see like the these amounts of short chain mm -hmm. fatty acids here mm -hmm. so because this is the dolomite rich interval yeah. so i think the fatty acids are quite well preserved yeah. to interpret but nlkins are much easier they they they, they are label labeled mm -hmm. quite similar but i think the nlkins uh, as they come from the the vegetation, the yeah. from the surrounding area, I think they, as they come much more from the surrounding area, I think they can be much more affected by the the genetic effects mm -hmm. than the fatty acids. That, mm -hmm. as far as I interpreted, they are much more in situ production than mm -hmm. um, vegetation. Uh, but you have somehow a sort of like a bimodal distribution on on, mm -hmm. on the, yeah. in that area yeah. with the mode that is higher in the in the uh, sort of short change uh, acids and this is uh, quite indicate indicative of, of microbial activity yeah. so I think that the yeah. data set the organic data set is quite coherent with uh, with what you have seen in the sedimentology and and in the other in the other uh, proxies that you have used, mm -hmm. and then I would just and also the, the the even the even composition is very typical of uh, well preserved compounds because if we had like odd we would say we could say that it was cleaved or not but as they are uh, all the the distribution is much more even than odd mm -hmm. for the fatty acids. We can mm -hmm. imagine that they are quite well preserved. Well preserved. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, um, so uh, you mentioned, for instance, um, the possibility. I mean, I like also the fact that you integrate the, um, for instance, the atmospheric circulation issues dealing to explain the changes in sedimentology and all that. Um, it's true that in the last year there has been a lot of um, work in in South America, particularly in Brazil and some areas of southern Brazil and Argentina about the uh, um, variation of the what they call the monsoonal like uh, the South American monsoonal like system. Mm -hmm. And I say like because usually the meteor people working in, in, in models, they don't like to, they say the South America is not really a monsoon that is completely different to what we see uh, in the rest of the world. But anyway, you know what I'm talking about. And I was wondering, I think that your data shows nicely these variations for if we can confirm perhaps a little bit better the age for the little ice age, this would mm -hmm. fit yeah. um, with several um, with several data that exists right now. How 
how you look at how that fit, for instance, with data in, in the stalagmite records in Brazil or, or for instance, in central Argentina, like in Laguna Mar Chiquita or things like that? Yeah, I, I started to correlate, but I didn't go very far on this. But it's something that I'm planning to do for the paper. I think I, I have to do a better correlation with the South America climate. I met. <laughs> I, I I would strongly yeah. recommend you to do that yeah. because in yeah. this this part of Brazil there are no many other records and I think that if mm -hmm. you can put that in the context of some other mm -hmm. records either south or, or more to central mm -hmm. it would be a nice yeah. piece of work and and it would uh, reinforce your climatic interpretations right yeah. Yeah, that's that's because uh, this climatic interpretation just came uh, almost uh, at the end the of the. Day, I know. Yeah, and then I said, okay, I, I have to to do a basic interpretation and then further correlate with other proxies and other areas. But I, I had I, I have done a correlation with the Botuvera cave. But mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I wrote it. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if it's on the thesis. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Katia, I would stop here. I would thank you again, Camila. And then eventually, if I get in, I pick up in some other question, I go back. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Daniel, for everything. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for your comments. And for sure, Camila will incorporate. <laughs> those on the discussions of the papers. Uh, let me pass the, the word now for Ana Paula. Ana Paula. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Did you sleep? No, 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 I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> I just put my camera down because sometimes it's better for connection. And here we have to mm -hmm. same room working. My husband's there, so he's teaching right now. So we have a not a good connection. So <laughs> because of that, okay. okay? <laughs> so uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Camila and Katia, mainly Camila, to choose me to be part of this journey with you. Was I'm really mm -hmm. happy to to be part of it, and I have to say that. Usually, PAGs has always up and downs. We have a lot of this, you know that. Since we start with the field trip, remember to collect the samples. It was hard. I don't know if you remember that, Hi, right? And Nicolai, I think if you see the picture over there, everybody tried to get the core and organize everything. Oh my God, remember. Such a drama. I remember also to have the, the skin burn. <laughs> oh yeah, it's true. Oh my, do you remember your leg? Worst part. Oh true. my God. <laughs> um, several legs. <laughs> exactly. So, and I was, I think we will start together in 2016, right? Yeah. And Camila, it's really nice to see how, to read your thesis right now and see your evolution this time. When I read your first proposal in 2016 and compare what you just gave to me now to read, it's totally different. Seriously, I'm really proud of you. Your thesis is excellent. Seriously, it's Thanks. really well written. And I'm really proud of you. So congratulations, okay? I will cry. A really nice presentation too. And I have to say that your presentation, you could summarize your thesis because the thesis is 180 huge. pages. Oh my God, <laughs> you know, it's huge. And I just, you'd like to say hi with everybody from the committee members because it's really nice to put a name in a face because Camila talks a lot about all of you. So now put the name <laughs> in a face, it's wonderful. So nice to meet you all, okay? <laughs> so Camila, let's go. I think you have really nice data and 
as I told you before, uh, we have here at least three papers, two, at least two, but I think three we can go with your water samples. So mm -hmm. the first one that I, the first paper that you can do is the deposition history. This all this, um, uh, they, this history that you told us right now about the, the, the lagoons, different deposition stages, and compare that with the climate change. And I really love how you did the comparison between the, your data with the upwelling and the motion and also the El Nino. The only thing that we need to do that we are also discussed about this before and then we have to put some proxy that show that. I, mm -hmm. For me, it needs to, you find a paper, they already published that, or go in the Hadley Center, I don't know, to get these data of El Nino or SST, a better SST with more higher resolution, okay? So I already mm -hmm. have a question that I will ask you, but I will ask you again. What do you think is the best proxy to compare this influence? For example, El Nino or, yeah, El Nino or the monsoons in your data, this difference in precipitations with your data? Well, uh, I would say that in this last this <laughs> just one second this last data here because uh, for me from my idea i think the reconstructed data if we were if we say that this is a, a good reconstruction uh, the precipitation the reconstruction of the, the data they are uh, reconstructed is uh, for the whole the entire area so i think we can uh, amplify this data for the entire coast and maybe correlate this with the El Nino. Because uh, this, this data as, um, I don't know if I mentioned, but this is, is a, com a combination of Lagoa Vermelha and also Brejo de Spin, which is this data here. So if I combine those, these two data, I can get this plot here, the black plot, and then uh, I would say that this would be the best to fit with a future El Nino proxy or SST because it would represent the precipitation change that is the atmospheric and uh, with a proxy of upwelling or other type of SST. And I think it would be a, a nice correlation. I, I agree with that. <laughs> I also think that we need to find, because the big issue now is to find a, a proxy already published that has a really higher resolution and include your time frame. That yeah, my time frame is, is the too. big problem right now, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. We need to sit everybody together to think about this, the best proxy that we can compare your data to show these fluctuations in the Nino or um, mm -hmm. welling, okay? So yeah. better resolution ones with better resolution, okay? Uh, so the other, so the second um, paper in my point of view will be with your biomarkers. So this will be a really nice paper that you can include and talk about the Dolomite so it will be really, really cool. And the third one that I told you before is with your water, compare water samples. The, you can compare this clear evidence of the changes in the any alkanes with the climate. That I see, when I saw your data, your plots, I said, oh my God, it's really cool. So I really, it's really, your thesis is really nice, okay? Oh, Camila, so, before I will be, can I be the, the annoying one here? Yeah. And go through your thesis. Take your place. <laughs> some points here. It's, it's not too much. It's just a few points and some curiosities. 
So I'm not seeing, I don't know how to do to see you and see my screen too, but you can hear me, right? Do you want to share your screen? I, I can stop sharing mine, you can no, share no, yours. It's fine because you can show if you need to explain something, you need your ah, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So I will be the annoying one just to try to improve a little bit your thesis, okay? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the, the thing that one of the things that I miss in your res, in your abstract, I think we talked about this before, was talk about uh, Brejo de Spin, oh. right? Because you talk a lot about Lagoa Vermelha, but in the end, you don't talk about Brejo de Spin, right? So we don't know what happened there. So just one phrase or two, Explain what happened with Brejo de Spinho in your thesis, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. yeah, I think uh, I almost forget about Brejo de Spinho in the abstract because <laughs> uh, I think my, my focus on this was to talk about the units and the correlation with the, uh, the sea level oscillations. And then as Brejo de Spinho was formed after the sea level drop, mm -hmm. I think it's just... Uh, through and I said, oh, well, okay, it's there, it's forming, still not nice. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I, I just passed through it, sorry. No, no, I agree, but just <laughs> one thing or two, just to, to show I, I did in Brazil this period too. Okay. <laughs> Another thing that I also agree with Dr. Judith and Dr. Daniel, it's about the age model. When you put in your objective, about your age model as one of the specific goals. I was thinking about after I, I read all, of course, after I read all your thesis, I say, okay, this is not one right now of the main objective of your thesis. And mm -hmm. I totally agree with them when you have to improve the model because we clear can see this different in the organic material that you did the, the, the age model and also mm -hmm. the, the carbonate, right? So we mm -hmm. see to, uh, uh, how I can explain this, to make a best model to try to explain why we have also this old carbonate mm -hmm. in your core. Mm -hmm. So I totally agree with what was discussed before, mm -hmm. okay? Um, just a little bit. I'm, could I make a comment? Also, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Simply because uh, Gabby, Gabby Nacimento, she also uh, didn't have as high resolution of the dating, but she did look at the, the impact of old carbon in these in systems. And so mm -hmm. in a way, I think combining your data, uh, Camila, with mm -hmm. Gabby's data would be very useful. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I think I, I need, uh, yeah, I think this, this amount of data needs a better discussion. Mm -hmm. Almost <laughs> a, a, a one chapter about radiocarbon analysis because exactly. it's very interesting. And uh, we can also talk about the carbon cycle and other stuff and this, and this, uh, in this context of the radiocarbon age. So I think I, I can do a better discussion for a future <laughs> paper. <laughs> Camila, another thing hmm? I think I already asked you, is just a curiosity for me because I'm not hmm. familiar with this uh, kind of expression or terms, okay? So for me, hmm. I, just a question about aphanitic layers. Because when I think about aphanitic layers, always comes to my mind igneous rocks and the, the fine grains inside. So what do you mean about the aphanitic layer, layers in this case is more about the texture of the fine sediments inside, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, as far as I understand the, the aphanitic, uh, I, I would say that I, I'm talking about the absence of uh, structure, the fine, very fine grains. Uh, that's it. Yeah, yeah. The very fine grained and the absence of 
structures. Because I don't know if there is a specific term for dolomite stuff. I'm not a specialist on this, you know. <laughs> so, always uh, when you put affinity in my mind, I always remember for igneous rocks in the really fine sediment, they cannot identify the minerals. I, so, I, I will add a comment here. That yeah, term please. comes from Juan Carlos Braga, who's a specialist. <laughs> and he actually told us that we should call, we should name it that. So in a way, Camila's inherited this from the past. Yeah, but, okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> I would comment this right now. Yeah. But, but also, I, also, I would comment this right now. Hmm? Also, often it is just a description, no? But people yeah. call yeah. light too. This kind yeah. of or massive, mm -hmm. you know? massive. Exactly. Yeah. 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 In Pritzau, for instance, in Prisal, you call massive. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I was the, trying to follow the the previous work to use uh, if always you go the to same. The, the stromatolites, you know. People mm -hmm. that do stromatolite, they call leolite. Leolite, uh -huh. kind of, never saw that. I never saw leolite, but uh, it is great. But that's why you call a phonetic, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I totally understand. I mean, just was curious about this because. <laughs> yeah, well, like, uh, actually, I need to confess, I need, I need to confess that I, I also saw quite strange. Because affinity is definitely a, a texture used in, igno in igneous rocks to when you could not see the crystals. Exactly. It's too fine. But I, I was so used to also to see this kind of things when a, a term of some area is used for another area. Then actually I saw, well, I, I never saw that for, ca for carbonate, but perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was just trying to follow the previous work. So. We can we can see when I, when you read my work or when you read Gabby's work when you read Annelise's work and the previous one, we can we can see a context and a history all together. So I thought that was easier to, to comprehend this way. Okay, all right. So Camila, another question for you is about the your plot in the figure nineteen. I think the page is 15, mm. if you want to go there. Nine. In, the, P, in the, the PDF, okay? 53, to be exactly. Ah. But I just 53. want to talk about this difference between the hydrological balance in the Lagoa Vermelha and the Brejo do Spin. How you explain in terms of the change in the climate? So, uh, I would say that that's uh, the same answer that I, I gave to Daniel about the Stromson. That's because today we have much more the Lagoa Vermelha receiving the water from the, the ocean side and also from the Lagoa de Roma than Brejo do Spin. Maybe that's because of the, the high of the reservoir, the water reservoir, or yeah, I think it's major because of this. Okay, thank you. Let's see. <laughs> In oh, my, my yeah. people. Uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry, can you continue? We can continue. No, 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 uh, you can go, sorry. <laughs> okay, one thing that, that I already, we already discussed about this, is about your grain size analysis, right? <laughs> There is a lot of noise on that. You agree yeah. with that? Yeah. And I think what fantastic that you removed from your presentation. And I really like that. <laughs> it's a really close environment. So it's really mm -hmm. difficult. You take um, grand size analysis and see difference in different units based on yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So, but for me, if I were you, I will remove this part. But you, you did all the work and you have to put in your thesis. It's totally fine. So, but uh, I want to ask you about your, um, your PCA. And I want to ask you why you divide 
For example, in this case, in figure 28, in four groups, because the idea of the PCA is the re you can reduce the amount of data without missing uh, too much information, right? So why you group in four or not less than this? I mean, in the in the figure twenty. Okay, figure twenty how twenty twenty eight. What? Okay. Uh, uh, I would explain you, okay, so here, this one, right? <laughs> the PDF is 64. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah that's it. Uh, I would say, uh, I'm not sure if it's right or not. You can, you can tell me, but I used it the, the first, this, this screen plot, and then I saw- Can you, can that, you please uh, the, the picture? Uh, Anna, what's the number, Anna? 28. The figure 28 is in the 64 in the PDF. Because I, I have the old PDF. So. <laughs> okay, so what I, what I thought is that uh, I was trying to, to group the maximum of the, the variations of the, the, the grain size analysis. And then after I saw this first one on the my left, I saw that uh, probably the four groups, the four first bars would represent better, would give us like 90 something percent of the total distribution. And then I group it, the, I cluster it, the, the PCA based mm -hmm. on this first one, because it would represent better the total amount uh, after a zero point something I didn't consider as a, a real group. I just considered the first part of the, the charge. Is okay. it clear? No, it is. And it's just um, when I use the PCR, I always try to put all the data. Of course, here you don't have too many data to put in the PCR for mm -hmm. the size, but we, we actually use this to reduce our data yeah, no, I, I did, as yeah, I possible did without losing information. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I another thing that I, I noticed now is you put yeah. over there in the figure labor four groups, but I think you you dividing five in this one. But this is just a technical stuff. Not yeah, a yeah, I have the Lagoa Vermelha divided by in five and Brejo de Espinho divided the, in four groups. That's, that's what I did. I plotted the, all the data on the PCA and then the, 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 the statistics gives, gives me these four groups, these four bars that would represent mm -hmm. the, would be the most representative of the entire core. And then after that, I gave the information to the program to cluster them into four or five groups. So it was uh, a PCA with cluster. <laughs> All right. But anyway, in my opinion, grand size, we... Yeah, I have to, the to paper. tell you that uh, <laughs> the grand size was a bit uh, frustrating because it was my first analysis. And then after I got the results, I almost gave up because I said, okay, my course don't give me any information. <laughs> <laughs> and then I start to do the other analysis and I... I I became a bit more happy. <laughs> All right. Uh, another question that I have is in your page 105 in your PDF. Mm -hmm. in this end of paragraph, the third paragraph, I mean, you say that the TOC does not, do not increase toward the top, right? As it yeah. would be expected. And you also mm -hmm. say that could be explained by the factor that the previous studies has been carried out in more pristine place, right? Yeah. So yeah. I was wondering, what are you talking about? In, sorry, in each unit are you talking about? The whole unit, the last unit, or since the lacustrine the unit? So it sees the dolomite compression? 
uh, I, I was talking about the lacustrine units because compared to the previous work where Chris found around 10% and Gabby found around 10%, my values is very, very low compared to, comparison, comparing with them. And then they carried their stories in the middle, se middle sector of the lagoons. If we see the picture, the map, we see three sectors. The sector where we took, I, I took my core is the more anthropogenic influenced. Maybe there is more bio microbial degradation or something that I is did. not keeping the TOC. The only thing that intrigues me a little bit is because um, you always say during the same period, you have more preserved pigments. And now so you have yeah, layers true. rich of organ organic rich, right? Yeah. So this for me didn't make yeah. so much sense in terms of you have mm -hmm. uh, anthropogenic influence that kind of mess it up your core, you know? Yeah, no, I think uh, it's something to, to, to think about. But uh, the pigments are well preserved. The NLKs are well preserved. Maybe it's something like we can see uh, different uh, TOC composition in different parts of the lagoon. Because um, I think Katja was there with me when the German group came. And uh, we collected many cores inside this sector. And we could see different. Um, types of cores. Uh, they, we had like short cores full of a black organic part and short cores in another point full of carbonate. And then uh, this, this difference in the TOC would show me that uh, despite this is a small lagoon, but we have a different process ha happening in the different areas. So that, uh, that's what this TOC would say to me. Amela, I promise I'm finishing. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. And, <laughs> uh, in your, this, at the beginning of your discussion part, you miss a lot of, I think you forget to put the figure numbers. And sometimes it was hard to go back and find the figures, where was the figures, was the figure numbers. So please just put the figures number. And you have to understand this is a really big thesis. If you can put a hyperlink on that, it will be wonderful to go back on the I, I, I use it hyperlink, but uh, I'm not sure if it works on PDF. <laughs> um, at least not on mine. <laughs> so the thing that I have to say is that that I think you summarize pretty much in your presentation. And you already, you put a lot of data in your um, thesis that we can cut for, of, of course for your paper, like grain size and that lot of correlation that you did with the, the big table of correlation with the elements that I'm a kind of, do not 100% agree with all the correlation with the elements that you did. I move it to the annex. <laughs> <laughs> because you know that we already talked about the ratio that you used to, to make, for example, with titanium, that we see in your entire core that we don't have titanium. So they will be, of course, changed because of the other elements that you, you are comparing yeah. with. So we need to discuss mm -hmm. better about this. Mm -hmm. In general, you had a really good thesis and I'm really proud of you. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. <laughs> That's Thank uh, you, of Anna. course because all Thank of you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll pass now for Chris Ogono. Chris. Hi. Hi, Chris. Hi. <laughs> Hi Camille, I think I've, I've been not so long because I have been with Camille, you know, when <laughs> you know. <laughs> Living together. <laughs> Living in the same place, you know, I, I cook for her, you know. Yes, you know, the it's, best uh, beans ever. But uh, I, 
because your Islam is missing uh, some puree with cardamom uh, weed. Uh, okay. Mm. You know, let's go to cook that uh, pizza. I think. <laughs> but you know, we always talk about her teas during these dinners and some wine sometimes. And Jude as well. Jude, we, we have some a nice, nice time together in Zurich, you know. Yeah. That's why I don't have too many questions, but you know, and I'll know that uh, she did all this work in one year in, in Geneva, now in Zurich, in Geneva. It's hard, you know, because she worked with a specific compound to do the extractions, you know, to clean the sample. It's not easy, it's not a data that you put there and measure, like isotope, you know, it's this problem, you know, to fit the machine to, to the sample, you know, have to calibrate before. No, it's not easy, you know. Uh, what's good is she had more time, you know, to finish the work, but the work never finished, as you said, you know, we have been working these lakes in, in Brazil for, I've been there since I was in Ufi with the Sambaziva, John. And uh, Lauro, Professor Lauro, I think she, he dies, no? he started the work with him, no? Angela Rebelo, no? we, this was the 80s, no? it's, it's a long time, you know? it's a big project. So, and now I'm still, I'm still, there's some project I'm still working now. And that's why I'm going go to, to talk about the outline that she put in the end, the, the outlook. But could you put the outlook? Yeah. But yeah. before that, I want to ask about this, the question of Judy about the sedimentation ratio. Could you put mm -hmm. these slides? Yeah. And then I also talk about this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see here in the Dolomites, and you have this uh -huh. you know, very low sedimentation rate. So what you, you can talk about here about diagenesis, to have this so low sedimentation rate? Uh, about diagenesis, well, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I think we would since we are we are facing uh, an exposed environment, and then maybe we can we can talk something. But I'm not sure. I, I haven't think about diagenesis. Because, no, you, you know this, the, the, this, in the context of a low sedimentation rate. Yeah, because you know you have a low organic matter content. Yeah. Right? Yes. Then you have a lot of the the carbon become more negative. You know. Yeah, during the during the degradation. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why maybe we have this so low we don't show all the you know some diagen early diagenic process. Uh, yeah. So uh, when when we talk about uh, organic matter diagenesis, yes, maybe that's why we don't uh, we don't have uh, enough amount to measure, and then it can give us some error or something like this. But not the error because you know the if you degrade the organic, you know, when they yeah. we cannot you cannot have a, a precise you cannot you accumulate know. you accumulate, you know. Yeah, yeah. And but uh, it's it's very why you don't it's see, very... you know, you, I think to compare these two episodes there, you know. First in mm -hmm. the top here is high because you know the degradation didn't didn't Mm -hmm. Your diagenetic process didn't take place yet, you know. Yeah, it's a kind of interpretation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I think it's it's a kind of uh, or, yeah. Yeah. and so just this comment about the question about yeah. Judy. I think it's something that I, I I can bring to my mind because like most of the you have a high atlas, you know, in this because they suppose you know you have some mm -hmm. you don't see it has it's about hundred or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't have yeah, I, I, the, the thing I found that it, it's very interesting is that because the Doloma, Dolomitic interval on both cores, they, they show this decrease in sedimentation yeah. rates. 
yeah so i think it's it's a uh, uh maybe it's that it's a homogeneous homogeneous process that is happening so. okay i just if we go down to to your outlook mm -hmm. yeah if we go down there you said that you know in it not yet analyze the deuterium in short chain you know mm -hmm. and uh, of course now you, you, we analyze that with another student you know yeah what <laughs> really the, receive it the, pandem the pandemic situation you know you don't mm -hmm. have the data and everybody was shut down you don't have this you know, but, but which uh, what you expect about this isotope date for this? So, uh, in general, the short chain enokines or the enokinoic acids, they can give us information about the, 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 they give us information about the source of water. So, if we think that uh, high salinity, uh, uh, if I, I, I take the enalkanoic acids to get the information about salinity, I would see that during the dry per period where the, the, the lagoons, uh, uh, they, they have less water, uh, probably they would show uh, more deuterium and reach it as a talk. And then we could correlate this with a higher salinity. That's what I'm expecting to face when I get these results. And uh, maybe as we can see during the, the warm season, during the driest phase, that is also the warmest phase. And then it's also uh, a, a phase that when the lagoons dry out, uh, we can, we can, I think we can see like uh, three peaks, something like a mix it during the dry phase the, the wet phase, but during the summer, when the evaporation exceeds precipitation, we would find uh, deuterium and rich isotopes. And the beginning of the wet season, so about uh, November, uh, December, we would face less and rich deuterium isotopes. And then again, at the, at the dry season, we would face more deuterium and rich it because of the lack of precipitation. And then this we can use it to correlate with salinity because salinity is high uh, during the summer, during the wet season, when the evaporation exceeds precipitation. And then I think I, I could use this to correlate like this. But you know, uh, when you degrade the organic, you know, to have bisulfate reduction, you know, you produce H2S, no? Mm -hmm. yeah. This age, this this uh, H2S is enriching in light, in the hydrogen, you know, not in the deuterium. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Then you left over the the, the deuterium, you know, in the in the water. In the water. In the water. Mm -hmm. Do you think you, you, we affect your result for this? Yeah, definitely, because. Uh, as the, the microbial organisms, they use the water to synthesize their biomarkers, their compounds, and they use the, 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 water, the lagoon water to produce, the, to do the, their uh, metabolism. Probably we can find some deuterium enrichment in the isotopic composition. Because so I, I think I would, I would never, I, I, I would have to, to try to, to, to get a proxy or something that show me the sulfate reduction and then to try to, to see if it's not a, a, a process of more sulfate reduction activity that is releasing, that it's not releasing, but it's leaving behind the, in the tear in the water and then it's being incorporated into the organics. Because you have also, on, top, on top of that, you don't have only sulfate reduction, you have methanogenesis as well in this, yeah. in this, this environment, you know. Yeah. Of course, they affect the, the, 
the isotope in hydrogen and deuterium. Mm -hmm. for yeah. And yeah. another question, yeah. because no, I'm talking about that because the next step in this project is because Jude and I we work in Kurongo, Abu Dhabi, you know, and so all these environmental have dolomite, you know, but the easy one that have more results is in, in Brazil, you know. All those to go to Kurongo in Australia <laughs> is incredible, nice. Abu Dhabi as well is where Judy did her, her PhD in the 70s, was really a nice uh, work there, no? And now we work mm -hmm. in Qatar as well, with the Dolomite mm -hmm. there. And uh, every, 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 all this environment, they have organic matter involved in the mm -hmm. microbial, no? And mm -hmm. so, and now the next step for our project to do clamping in organic matter, which mm -hmm. John mm -hmm. Island, Stefano, mm -hmm. in Zurich, you know? And so that's why I'm asking that you, is, you know? Yeah. Uh, but the hydrogen, it's it's bound to carbon, and this is a very stable bound. So yeah, uh, but then they, when they clamp, they clamp deuterium, and no, they will clamp it. You know, deuterium yeah. and, yeah. and carbon. Yeah, surface. as far as far as I, I have read, uh, all the, the the literature said that the this this bound between hydrogen and carbon is very very stable. So early diagenesis it will, would not affect it very much, especially for hydrogen. I, I cannot say that for carbon is the same, but for hydrogen would be this. It's kind of a stable and early early diagenesis would not affect it. Affect it. Okay. okay. Another question that I have, you know, is uh, mm -hmm. for instance. If you go to to Italy, you know, to mm -hmm. the Dolomite Mount, and then you go to the Dolomite Principale, you know, in Zurich you call mm -hmm. Haupt, Haupt Dolomite, you know, Dolomite. Mm -hmm. And then, so if you go there, you know, you can you say this is a uh, environmental is uh, is a big. This, this environment is a, a Tets, you know, the Tets ocean, the Tets sea, mm -hmm. you know. I don't know if you know that you are a biologist, you know. No. The, <laughs> the biology. The, and so, what the correlation that you can do with this work that you have been done in Brazil, yeah. in mm -hmm. the geological record, record in uh, Italy, yeah. you know. For the Dolomita mm -hmm. print, a clue about that because you have a, a Mackenzie hypothesis, you know? Yeah, <laughs> Mackenzie hypothesis. <laughs> well, uh, I would say that previous work, the, as I, as I show in this picture here in the, in the Dolomites, they show that the nanoscales Dolom Dolomitic from like, microbial metal go vermelha is analogous to those in the microbiolytic phases in the hop to dolomite. So I would say that during the formation, based on my data, that we during the formation of that dolomite, we were facing a very, very dry and long that uh, dry episode when the, the Tetis, the, the previous ocean, was almost completely uh, dried out, was most completed, exposing the sediments, and the condition was, uh, uh, and it lasted long to, to precipitate, to, uh, uh, to the accretion, to formate the, these big dolomite knots. And of course that after was lifted up, lifted down and twisted and all the things. But uh, in general, I, I would say that, that the climate climate <laughs> was very dry and the uh, precipitation wasn't happening very much and the sediment was exposed. That's, that's, I would transfer to the geological record, for instance, for, for now. But you know, the sediment be very exposed, it would be exposed, be, I don't agree with you, but you know, there's another answer. The, for the, it's not exposed. The surface of the sediment is not exposed. 
would not be exposed. No, no, but but what phenomenon you could explain? Ah, this? of course, yeah, of course. As it's a, a notion, we would say that the, there is a large upwelling influence. Okay, thank you. This. Because our wine that you drink, you know, talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> All the wine. <laughs> the huge hypothesis no. <laughs> is a continuation. All the... <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it. That's of course we. This was happening because of the strong upwelling that was happening near coast. Well, that's a, that is a hypothesis. That is something that needs yeah. to be tested. Yeah. Because yeah. it's the yeah. Tethys yeah. Ocean and it's a, it is a huge, you know, the interesting thing, there's only one place in the world where you have coastal upwelling on the East Coast and that's Capo Frio. All the rest is like Peru, it's Namibia, it's, yeah, called, it's California. But in, in the case of, of the Dolomites, you have the, the Tethys Ocean is, it's not, it's, it's an East Coast continental margin. Mm -hmm. And so we have extreme evaporation there. There are major evaporite deposits there behind the Dolomite even. So, I mean, it's, it's a hypothesis for you to work on in the future. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm always in. <laughs> yeah, so I that that would uh, help to improve the uh, the hypothesis. This hypothesis that here, as we can see, the upwelling influencing the dolomite precipitation, we could transport this to the geological record and maybe say that by analogy the Dolomite uh, mountains would be formed during intense, intense upwelling events where everything was very, very dry. Mm, the evaporation was high. Okay, I just had to inter inter interrupt there, Chris, so it's all yours again. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> I just say that we didn't have enough time to finish yeah. it. To have, to have more data to, to make your thesis more complicated to write a paper. But anyway, <laughs> the, 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 we didn't finish our project in, in, in Dolomite yet, you know? And I hope you, you can continue work to. Yeah, I, I, that's everything I want to keep well, working uh, on this. This idea. You have it to, to take care about your correlations, no? Mm -hmm. They are not so. Yeah, sometimes the statistics proper. show something that the reality it's not. Point so five is not a good correlation, no? And you have to go yeah. there and yeah. things like that. Yeah. But anyway, the goal of the thesis was rich. I'm so happy that uh, to be part of this work. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I, I think I, I have no words to describe how, how I'm thankful to Chris to all his help. Uh, in, uh, write the paper. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I will, so I will have almost 5,000 words to thank you when I wrote the paper. <laughs> no, you have, to pay, you have to make a barbecue in Friburg to Judy and I. Yes, you were invited. Now, now we have a swimming pool. pool. <laughs> and Daniel too. Yes. yes, I have a swimming pool now, so you can all come no, so and enjoy the mountain. <laughs> in the ocean here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it has sauna. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Thanks, Chris. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I got to say. Thank you very much, Chris. I hope you are hearing me because my camera just disappeared. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah? Yes, yes, okay. Because my camera disappeared, I don't know what's happening, but okay. Uh, I will pass the, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I will pass the, the word now to Nicolas Strix. <laughs> Hi, Nicolas. Hi, gotcha. thanks. Thanks everybody. Thanks, uh, Camila to invite me for your, your thesis presentation, your thesis defense. So since I participated from your previous uh, thesis defense, we went through all the tests 
And now there is no much thing to to tell you about. I think most of the of the points that we raised, uh, I think was um, was okay. Was was attended and. Uh, there is just some reminding steps that I will go through very quickly. So, mm -hmm. and uh, well, again, congrats uh, regards your thesis. It's uh, it's a big work in in many aspects. <laughs> it's, a, it's also quite a large thesis. And uh, but well, so let's see. Looking through your abstract. I still think that you could make that more, more interesting in face of all your work. I think you still, I, I see still a little bit descriptive and uh, you could bring some of your, more of your most remarkable contribution to this work and uh, highlight that uh, on your abstract. Uh, just uh, a, a minor uh, observation, but uh, I, I'm not really familiar with uh, works on 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 Dolomites and particularly with La Guava Vermelha. But I think that your right resolution record permits you better understand the environment controls that uh, drive these Dolomite formation. And so, so, so I think you could put this uh, in your abstract more clearly. You got it, just to to make more, I would say, more attractive, because it's it's a wonderful work, and I think you can uh, do your your abstract more attractive at this point and less descriptive at some point. Uh, another, well, some other minor steps that uh, um, I see is like, and when you said that actually the area is characterized, is characterized as a semi-arid climate, and you put uh, annual precipitation of 800 millimeters, do, do you really think that this, this amount of precipitation, it's, uh, it's it's typical of a semi-arid region. 800 or, yeah. In, in the I'm thesis, sure. I think the page is mm -hmm. 17. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I so, wrote this. At some point, let's see. I think in the page 17. Yeah, yeah. yeah I know, I, I wrote this somewhere. <laughs> I remember. And, uh, so I, I use the previous definition of uh, Barbieri that says that this is a semi-arid, but we can see when we, comp when we compare the, the precipitation in Rio de Janeiro and the precipitation in this at the Sturry area, we can see that we have this enclosed characteristic that is very, very dry. And uh, even if we don't see the data, if we just go there and we see the vegetation and all the, the, the composition of the environment, they, it's, char it's characterized perfectly a um, uh, microclimatic climatic semi arid. The vegetation is mm. almost uh, uh, cactus and things that we can see in other semi arid conditions. Well, on my opinion, it's um, it's drier than the tropical climate that you have around, but it's mm -hmm. still not a semi-arid. A semi-arid is it's near the half of the precipitation. Like semi-arid, a semi-arid area, semi-desert, like we have in the in the north end of the country, is usually around uh, 300 millimeter, 400 millimeter of precipitation. So I, I don't know if sure it's about yeah. 800. I think it's around 400. Okay, if it's around yeah. 400, okay, could be a yeah. semi yard, but yeah, I think it's looking, around 400. Yeah. yeah, well, check it ju just to make sure that yeah. actually yeah. it's, yeah. it's I, really I a semi yard because, because yeah. I think this, this is work from Evandro, Professor Evandro. 
from you know Barbier, yeah. Bar Barbier, yeah. 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 In, but I think it's way. around four hundred. She did. It's a microclimate anyway. Yeah. Okay, so it's very, very, very local. Yeah, very yeah, local microclimate. Yeah. If you go there, the vegetation change, you know, it's, yeah. and uh, it's more cactus. If you go to Real do Cabo, you see. In the yeah. on top of the I, line, I think I did that. You see yeah. the vegetation I, I was really to put... from the Caatinga, no? They call Caatinga yeah. Carioca, no? Yeah. The place. <laughs> yeah. Uh... Okay. Okay, so, and um, let's see. And then uh, the, there's a, um, then moving to, to, to results and discussion, there's a point that was raised by Ana Paula that I, that I, that I agree, like, and also put at his tags that actually it would be very interesting if you compare. I mean, one of the most consistent things that you show in your, in your records regards the isotopes is actually you see a consistent a consistent trend in the delta T composition uh, of the carbonate both in, in Lagoa Vermelha and the Brejo do Espinho. So they are very consistent in terms of the isotope record, uh, principal in this last millennium. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think it would be interesting if you also compare with other available paleoclimate reconstructions. Like there's Botuverá, but there's also Spilothems at South of São Paulo with uh, an isotope record covering the last millennium. That would be interesting to compare to see if what you're seeing at uh, Brejo do Espinho, da Gua Vermelha, if, if this isotope trend is also consistent with the isotope of the other climate record, or if it's or if it's something more restricted, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. uh, th th this is very interesting. Mm -hmm. No, you can you can go. Okay, so and uh, and then I, I look in your in your discussions. I see that actually you you also compare with or. You discuss about the whole of uh, of El Nio, mm -hmm. trying to establish some connections with Enzo, with Enzo. But I think that probably you should try to focus more on South Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. Before moving to a comparison with with El Nio-like oscillations, because have you tried to compare? your precipitation records with Pacific and see if there's really a good resemblance with Pacific? Uh, no, I, I don't think I did I did it. I, I did the, the plot with the South, uh, South Atlantic Dipole. Yeah, the South Atlantic mm -hmm. Dipole. And it doesn't, um, it's antiphase. However, uh, the record my record is not at the same resolution. The Ilana Viner, I think it's Ilana Viner, the Viner mm -hmm. data, uh, it's much better for longer time before my, my record than the time of my record. So, and the time I, I was uh, expecting to see the, the change in the Dolomite. So I couldn't compare very well. And, and why and so and so and why did you try to establish a connection with with Enzo? What had motivated uh, you? Uh, yeah, as far as I read, the Enzo, the El Nino events, they would uh, favor the upwelling because the occurrence of El Nino would block the the entrance of the south southwestern and southeastern trade winds. And this would favor the the entrance of the northeastern trade winds. That is the trade winds that uh, pushes the Brazilian current to ocean to the ocean and allows the upwelling of the South Atlantic coastal water. That's why I, I, I tried this correlation because I think that maybe the the upwelling could be being influenced by this. 
and okay. mm. try to, to correlate it with Dolomites. <laughs> okay, well, actually, looking through the paleoclimate records, uh, for the South Atlantic, we have no much right resolution reconstruction for CSU phase temperature. I mean, this is a major problem, which sometimes yeah. prevents us to, to really compare how the term evolution of the South Atlantic have drive precipitation variability or climate variability along at least the last millennium. For, for long time yeah. scales for Holocene or glacial, it's okay. But for the last yeah. millennium, it's really a problem. However, for Pacific, we, uh, there's a lot of uh, CO2 phase temperature reconstructions covering the last millennium with a quite good yeah. resolution. And, um, and I also know that it's very hard to say what is a new event in the paleoclimate record. Because actually even looking through the, through the current instrumental record, sometimes there is no clear consensus about if, uh, what is an ENSO event. And there's many areas where we, we see changes in, in surface temperature in the Pacific, but the, the, there is some quite good reconstructions of Pacific temperature variability, or if you can, if you can put on a more big uh, uh, package, like changes in the zonal circulation of Pacific. There's a record from Conroy that covers the last millennium in the Galapagos Island. That is a, a, a quite a good uh, proxy for Enzo. And also there's very nice uh, surface, uh, sea surface temperature from in the Pacific area that ultimately also affects the could drive variability in precipitation at that part. It's more related through Hosby waves, but also affects the climatology of these of these area. So then you can compare and see if there's any consistent during the last millennium uh, in, in both your your trend that you see in the isotope and these surface temperatures. And you okay. see, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, I think because. At the beginning, it will be quite a speculative to compare with Pacific with no direct comparison with another proxy. But at the beginning, I would say probably South Atlantic would be more would be more important to drive changes in precipitation than Pacific itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I, I show you, I will show you something re re really quickly here. Mm -hmm. I, I will stop. Sharing the screen. It's very, it's very quickly. It's, it's also still very yeah. speculative. Yeah, I, I think, I think I, I can try to to compare it, to to plot against different uh, proxies for Pacific or North Atlantic. Because if I'm I'm talking about climatic conditions, uh, in general, they are all correlating. Or if they don't correlate, I, I, we need to find an, a, a reasonable explanation for this. <laughs> mm. ha, ha, have you seen that, this graph? Mm, Look up, no, I, I don't think. No, no, but, but, but are you seeing my, are you seeing my, my Oh, yeah, screen? yeah, I'm seeing, uh, yeah, I can see. Yeah. Okay, so this graph in blue, Mm -hmm. is the local precipitation at your study site. Uh -huh. Actually, I, I perform a running mean of five years to smooth the variability. Uh -huh. And uh, on red is, this, is the surface temperature of tropical South Atlantic. Uh -huh. This Actually, is if you see, more modern, okay. No, yeah, this is the modern since 1920 to the current period. Mm -hmm. And if you see, actually, they have a quite a similar pacing uh -huh. of decade of variability. They are very similar. Of course, th th this is the, the trend surface temperature of uh, of tropical South Atlantic. Because if you if you take a look to the temperature of tropical South Atlantic, actually, it's warming, steep mm -hmm. falling. 
the, the, the swarming trend, trend. global uh -huh. warming, basically. Yeah. But if I uh -huh. do trend and then apply a running mean, we see a similar pacing. Uh -huh. So probably what we are seeing when you compare uh, your isotopes is a climate change that it is that could be related to to evo to uh, thermal change in the tropical South Atlantic. I mean, based on the, on the on the current climatology, this is a more straightforward comparison or correlation. Mm -hmm. But if you want to check that, really, you should compare based on proxies. You can mm -hmm. use another precipitation proxy independent, like try those speedotems from South and Brazil that is close to your area. Mm -hmm. Or if, it, if they not go hand in hand, if, if they are decoping, probably because it's related to, because actually your area sometimes is quite difficult to, comp to, 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 to interpret it because it's not just a function of temperature, uh, of precipitation, but it's also a function of, of winds that can drive yeah. the change in the upwelling, okay? Yeah. yeah. And then sometimes, you have a strong South Southern convergence zone moves uh, south, moving to the south, increasing precipitation in the south in Brazil, or but and, uh, and enhancing the trade winds could uh, drive dry years there. So, but okay, if you want to compare with Pacific, again, try to bring those those records from Pacific to see if it's make if it makes sense or. Mm -hmm. Because on the other hand, it would be quite a speculative. So actually, well, yeah. that, that was just my, my observations regards your paleoclimate um, interpretations. And is that, Camila? I think, I mean, your thesis is really great, the way how you present all your records and the comparison, and also the calibration study. Congrats, because again, it, it, um, it's very interesting to see that first you compare uh, uh, records that along a uh, uh, time series uh, um, records that you collect along the last years to see how the isotope really works, and then you go through the past. So, and and I think this is this is really interesting. And yeah, it's that. I have some other small comments, but I think I think it's. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. I'm very happy with this that you you show show now, because uh, I think uh, I as Ana Paula said before, I think we can have at least two papers. But I, I, in my mind, I have just one paper for this uh, modern record of the the change in the water position, especially because we have the, the data since. Chris started to study there. Annelise did also the water sample analysis. Gabby also did. So I think we have a large time series. And uh, as you show now, we can compare. So we can just put there and see if it's matching and to see if the, 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 the area is influenced by something more globally or if it's something more restricted to the area. So this, is, this will help a lot to the paleo records. Camila, I think Daniel and mm -hmm. Daniel did some work in Argentina, as far as I know. And talk about the younger dries, no? Yeah, but that is a lot older the the record yeah. than the record that you have now in La Guava mm -hmm. But I think that is mostly the work, for instance, from Eduardo Piovano in some uh, Laguna, Laguna Mar Chiquita, and also in some other uh, lagoons in, in the Buenos Aires province. So mm -hmm. yeah, I can I can pass you that info. Um, no, no. no. I think I think we can use this large time series to produce mm -hmm. a, a very interesting climatic uh, conclusion about the, the change mm -hmm. that we have seen during these years. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, in general, I would agree what Nicolas showed because really uh, it makes a lot more sense that the, the mm -hmm. ocean circulation and the Southern Ocean had a, a stronger impact than the, the Pacific. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah. I mean, if you think in what we know about the climate in Argentina, for instance, there is what is called the, yeah. the arid diagonal that separates um, the influence of the Pacific yeah. from the one Atlantic. And yeah. in Brazil, it doesn't feed at all in that, uh, in that distribution. Mm -hmm. For today, in the past, it might be different, but I don't think that during the Holocene was a lot more different. Mm -hmm. than Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Camila. Yeah, I have to send a message on Luisa to tell her that. Ah, Camila, yeah. I have the worst uh, question ever for you. Oh no, I don't want to listen. <laughs> the last one. What you gonna do next? Uh, well, next I have lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I don't tell. <laughs> But, uh, Vocês estão me ouvindo? Porque minha tela está me ouvindo. Estou, estou. I will try to, to think about the papers that I want to write. First, I will write the sedimentological parts of the paper because it's almost done and I don't need to wait any further data. And then think about the biomarkers that we still have to, we, st we are still waiting for the 13, data 13C that can inform us about the vegetation change and everything. And then looking for a postdoc. Hey, you okay. on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. And 10 days of vacation. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yes, Katya. Okay, uh, Nicolás, fin did Nicolás finish? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I will ask uh, Anna to, well, uh, first of all, let me, I can, I can see you anymore. I can see the, the meeting anymore. I just, my <laughs> microphone is, is functioning. I don't know why yeah. I am in a brand new computer. I don't know what happened, <laughs> but I'm here <laughs> and I can now uh, say some few words to Camila. I already uh, uh, corrected the document with her and participated in the pre-thesis uh, defense uh, uh, with uh, Nicolás and Marcelo. And we, um, what I would like to say to Camila uh, right now is that you are a, a really nice surprise because uh, you arrived in my uh, room uh, four years ago uh, asking me to work with foraminifera. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I just uh, uh, informed you about the work in this kind of environment, but you insisted in work with Ferminifera, so I, I, I was uh, really uh, proud of you on that time, but as soon as you finished the, the uh, or, or arrived to the conclusion that you, the, the Ferminifera is a little bit uh, Just, uh, louder, <laughs> to, uh, to you, uh, uh, Sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, um, I, I did the first Korea, year uh, trying to speaking of for a minute for <laughs> computer, but uh, I'm I'm really uh, happy that you uh, find a way of uh, studying these uh, ecosystems because uh, um, uh, although we have a lot of works already done in this kind of environment. Uh, I think we uh, have a lot to find uh, about the, the sulfates and uh, the importance of methanogenic uh, bacteria and all, all those uh, uh, influencers, bacteria, uh, reduced sulfate bacteria and methanogenic ones and uh, the, how they control the salinity and the sulfate in this uh, and this uh, ecosystem, what the influence of organic matter in this ecosystem. So we have a lot of uh, new uh, frontiers to, to, 
to to look for and this and, and Camila started this way she started doing this and and I'm really proud of you today Camila unfortunately you cannot thanks see so much, my okay. face but I'm <laughs> very happy <laughs> thanks a lot I'm, I'm very so, happy with all the the help I I had from all of you that uh, at some point were doing this work with me so without this help I couldn't um, realize my dream that was study this this weird but uh, amazing environment uh, go to Switzerland that was a second dream and uh, meet the amazing people that I met and that's it I think I, I have friends for my entire life and uh, I did a great journey to do my PhD and something that Chris taught me that is the PhD is not only the results that we, we, we can produce, it's all for the experience that we have. And I, I have to say that I had the best experience ever and compared with all the other students I know, uh, my mine were the best. <laughs> So thanks a lot. Without you and this discussion, it wouldn't be the same. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome, Camila. <laughs> so I will, I will ask Anna now to, to uh, uh, close the 